Hi, welcome everyone. Today we're going to be talking about Manjaro, the latest medication to be launched in the management of type 2 diabetes. And literally this weekend in February 2024, the, the lorries bringing the supply of this medication are on its way to these shores in the UK. So let's first of all just talk a little bit about the context of type 2 diabetes and the, the landscape a little bit that this new medication is going to be launched into. So we know that actually over 4 million people in the UK have type 2 diabetes, the numbers are increasing. We also know that over 90% of people with type 2 diabetes are either overweight or have obesity. Um, and the two together, you know, uh, type 2 diabetes and obesity, obviously have a massive impact on increasing the risk of complications, particularly cardiovascular disease, yeah. uh, and the impact and burden that would have not only on people living with type 2 diabetes, but also on the health service as well. So really, when it comes to medical management of type 2 diabetes, we're really looking for medications that not only help with glucose management, but also weight management as well. Uh, and perhaps that's where tazepatide comes in. Uh, so Patrick, tell us a little bit more about tazepatide. So tazepatide, um, brand name Manjaro, is, is a, a twinkertrin. So it's, it's, uh, and it's a once weekly injection, uh, licensed for both type two diabetes and actually obesity. Um, in terms of that twinkertrin, so it's a dual agonist. It's one single molecule, but it can stimulate two receptors. One is GLP-1, which people probably are more, most aware of, and the other one is glucose dependent insulotropic polypeptide, GIP for short. I mean, let's keep that one short. So it's, and that's, uh, if you're saying, well, what is that? That's, a, that's actually a very, really common in creatine, which is produced uh, in, in greater number actually than GLP-1. So if you've been using a DPP-4 inhibitor, you've been in, in, enhancing um, uh, GIP, or if you've been sending patients for bariatric surgery, you've been enhancing GIP. So it's something in a sense we've been used to for quite some time, but now we have a direct um, agonist and and the combination of that seems to um, actually drive improved uh, clinical outcomes in terms of HbA1c and weight. The product is in the UK is going to come in the uh, Lily Quick pen, so people will be used to that as the uh, the disposable pen that um, uh, we have in uh, the Lily Insulin range. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the effects of this in type 2 diabetes, and let's focus on that. So we, it comes in different doses, so um, uh, 2.5, 5, 7.5, 10, uh, 12.5, 15. The, the usual treatment dose has been 5, 10, 15. So, so these have impacts, in, uh, great impacts on HbA1c. In fact, this is class leading, um, uh, not just class leading across the whole incretin range. So you're looking at um, HbA1c reductions between 1.5 and uh, 2%, or uh, if we're going down to millimoles, sort of top 19 to 22 millimoles. Um, and so stuff you only would see really with a basal bolus regime otherwise. Um, and in terms of weight, it depends on the study, but you're looking at probably between 5 and 15%. Um, uh, generally with type 2 diabetes. So you've casually mentioned some really uh, significant improvements yeah. potentially with this molecule, isn't Absolutely. it? In terms of A1C and weight. And as you mentioned, as far as non-insulin therapies, this is perhaps right at the top of the, the pack, isn't it? Absolutely. This is a, this is this is your gold standard now. So it's, uh, yeah, casually do, because I've been, look been looking at this data for years. So I mean, it's been out in the States for well over a year. So, so although this will be new for a lot of people, this isn't new to us. This is something we've been talking about uh, for a while. But yeah, absolutely, it's really exciting to, to get this now. Um, so it's available, hopefully, for our patients. Maybe we'll come back to that one. Um, and the other, I suppose, when we talked about the beneficial effects, what about adverse effects? So, so the adverse effects do to, seem to be very similar, actually, to the GLP-1s that we're using. Um, so you, in clinical studies, you're getting a similar dropout of between 5 and 10% of people because of adverse effects. They tend to be mainly GI. Uh, they tend to be when people initiate and when they titrate up. 
Um, so the shorter the you titrate up, actually the shorter period of time you may get those. And maybe we'll come back to that when it comes to clinical practice, because I think we're probably going to be concentrating for type 2 diabetes on those lower doses, the 2.5 and 5 milligram doses. So, so it's, it's um, but yeah, it's exciting, um, I think, uh, and I do think it has the potential to really transform some care uh, within the UK and, and meet some of this unmet need which is out there. And, and all of this comes off the back of some extensive clinical research. Yeah. Uh, and tazepatide has been researched not only for type 2 diabetes, also for obesity. In terms of the type 2 diabetes studies, uh, for those of us who are interested, perhaps some top lines from the, the, the randomized controlled trials that we've seen? So, so I, I suppose, yeah, so if we go with probably the cleanest of all of the studies to pass one, you're looking at, in terms of HbA1c, about 22 millimoles, um, uh, in terms of HbA1c, in terms of weight, in that study it was about 8.8 .8 kilograms at the top dose. You tend to get, overall you get 90% of the, however, you get 90% of the glucose lowering um, with the 5 milligram dose compared to the 15 milligram dose. So you really get your bang for your buck at those lower doses, just as we do with statins, for example. And when it comes to weight, it's slightly different with the higher doses. So with the lower doses, maybe 70% of the benefits you're going to see um, uh, at a 15 milligram dose, you would see at a 5 milligram dose. But, but it, the 5 milligram dose is such an effective dose. And, and, and for clinical utility, it's one month at 2.5 and then potentially, assuming they're tolerating, one month uh, and then they're straight on to the 5 milligram dose. Okay. Now that's quicker than we've had with other GLP-1s to get them up to that dose. And that, that 5 milligram dose is, you know, more effective than a Zempic, for example. Okay. So okay. you're talking about, you know, that's why I was saying class leading. So off the back of all of this, the, the clinical trials, we had a nice technology appraisal yep. that has given us some clarity in terms of the utilisation um, of uh, tazepatide. So where does it sit? What's the recommendation from NICE? And essentially they've said for, for people with type 2 diabetes as an adjunct to lifestyle management, to consider the use of tazepatide after a person has been put on three oral agents. Um, uh, and then BMI considerations, obviously if a person is above uh, BMI of 35 uh, and perhaps starting insulin may have an impact on their occupation to consider tazepatide in that scenario. Or with a BMI of under 35, um, for people for whom uh, might be at high risk of developing complications of obesity which in my opinion is almost everyone who has obesity is at risk of developing a complication. So when you think about that, um, that technology appraisal from NICE, it's essentially what the NICE recommendation is for GLP-1s, isn't it, from their, their last update uh, of type 2 diabetes management. So, so quite similar there, uh, aren't we? So how does this actually play out, Patrick, in terms of implementation in primary care? Maybe a little bit about the practicalities that yeah. we need to be thinking about. So I, I suppose it's, so what you've already mentioned is we've got a nice technology appraisal for type two diabetes. So that means it will be on formula in some shape or form in every health system within, uh, certainly within England and Wales and Northern Ireland. So um, uh, in my health system, it's green. So certainly at the lower doses, up to five below, it's green. Um, specialist initiation, on higher doses or specialist recommendation on higher doses. So green meaning this is the primary care absolutely. initiation there is no medication. Restriction. So so and absolutely the um, the huge amount of inertia which goes on in the management and I think if we're waiting for people to be referred up to hospital um, uh, I mean Let's, let's be honest, uh, we've got a lot of our patients seem to be initiated by beauticians and Lord knows what when we're talking about GLP-1 for weight loss. These are the, so these are similar products. So I, I don't see why they cannot be initiated. You, you need to be careful to make sure they've not got unstable eye disease. Um, uh, you've, you know, you're not managing um, uh, an uns you know, type 1 diabetes and all those usual cautions you would do. So nothing um, different from initiating a GLP-1 in years gone by? Correct. Yeah. Correct. I would just, although it's a different class, I would say in terms of practical considerations, it is the same. Okay. Um, and any other practical considerations we need to be thinking about? Uh, the type of patient, perhaps, who we should be looking at? Sure. You know, doing some searches on our clinical systems and identifying as someone who would benefit? 
Well, as you say, I mean, I think if, if we're trying to um, uh, manage patients according to the nice technology appraisal where, where it's meant to be most cost effective, I think those patients with a slightly higher BMI, those certainly those patients with poor glycemic control, uh, despite three agents, um, I would say as with any long-term condition, those people who are going to experience it for the longest period of time have got the most benefit. So younger people, not obviously for women, if it's, they've got to have contraception if it's childbearing age, and that's true with other chippy ones. Um, so, um, so there's a clear benefit. People who are perhaps less um, useful are those people where losing a lot of weight, particularly if it's associated with a bit of uh, muscle loss, where there's a bit of controversy still about, about these agents and how much they impact on muscle loss. But, but older people just need to be a little bit more cautious, particularly if there's any element of frailty, because that, uh, and, and as always with diabetes, and I can't say it often enough, I always check to make sure it's not type 1 diabetes. If they've got poor glycemic control, you, you know, because that those, those, uh, this isn't a treatment for type 1 diabetes. Of course. And yeah. that's something that I think is part of the assessment and management of a person with diabetes yeah. now, isn't it? We are quite used to um, uh, having that as part of our, uh, our thought process. Okay, so let's take one step further into really the landscape of type 2 diabetes management at the moment. Mm. We're in a situation right now where we have a global shortage, uh, a real supply and demand issue essentially for the GLP-1 class. Uh, perhaps a lot of that has been driven by uh, the expansive use of GLP-1s for weight management, mm. particularly in different health systems, the private sector as well. Uh, and that has had a massive impact on people being able to prescribe GLP-1s in the UK. Um, we know that with tazepatide, it's being launched initially with its two doses, 2.5 and 5 milligrams. As I said, it's being kind of brought into the country as we speak at the moment. But with this molecule being launched in this environment of GLP-1 shortages, um, what are your initial thoughts about that? How does this play out for tazepatide being prescribed in primary care? And some of, the, some of the concerns that we may have in this environment of supply shortages at the moment. Yes, it's challenging. I think if we look at, at, at if we include um, tazepatide in that in creatine GLP-1 class group, really we've only got one I have confidence with, um, um, and that's Rebelsis, uh, because it doesn't require any plastics. So the supply chains are a bit simpler, and we've been given notification from the uh, 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 the MHRA that supply issues and Department of Health that supply issues for this year 2024 are going to be okay with that product. Everything else, there's interruption supply. Now they've not mentioned tazepatide, but tazepatide is a very effective weight loss treatment, so it's more effective, arguably, than uh, we go the. So, um, so for that reason. I suspect it's going to be, and it's licensed for obesity, so I suspect it's going to be popular in private weight loss clinics. So controlling supply chains is going to be a challenge for Lily. They tell me there's not, it's not going to be a problem. I've got no reason not to believe them other than I've seen these issues with other companies. So I think it, on a practical basis, whilst it is an option and, and arguably uh, the, as, as good an option if you want to one sweep the GLP-1 receptor agonist or similar, this is supply maybe better we're using a quick pen which is easier probably to produce and is a more global product um, than other devices but but it's so so it's an option and, and if we want the ones weekly probably the best one but you're still going to need to caution your patients that there may be interruption to supply you need to mitigate to make sure that they don't run too tight in terms of stock and you, and you may need to have consultations about um, restarting at a lower dose if there has been interruption or switching to an alternative product. Okay, uh, let's not get too ahead of ourselves and end on a really positive yeah. note because for me this is a really exciting time in the management of type 2 diabetes. We have a, a new product being launched that is really going to have an impact on glucose control and weight management and it's the first time in, in some time actually that we've had uh, a product being launched like that for the medical management of type 2 diabetes. So the name Tazepatide Munjaro, uh, remember the name, it's going to be talked about a lot in the coming weeks and months uh, and I think it's going to be really important to consider as part of the management of type 2 diabetes. That's all from us today. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed this video. Please do reach out to us across our socials and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Take care.